everyone. Welcome to another awesome day of FileMaker training. I'm Richard Carlton, creator of FMTrain.tv. And today is a very exciting day because we're getting ready to do a couple different things. Today is a really awesome topic about FileMaker Server. It's under the hood, under the weeds. It's totally secret stuff. A UFO came and gave us this information. In fact, you can only find this information if you know where to dig, where the bodies are buried. Meanwhile, also part of the broadcast today, trying it out is the Moyers. Welcome, Moyers. Are you there? I'm here. He's here. I'm here. Oh, they're, we're practicing with them, right? So, Chris, you want to say hi? Hi. How's it going? Show us your face. Show us your smiley face. So, Chris Moyer is one of the creators, uh, one of the stalwart anchor pillars of the FileMaker community. He's been around for a while, uh, if I can hit the button there. And so he is actually going to be uh, visiting at us. I've been whining at him for a long time to come. And he's finally here along with Heidi Porter. This is Heidi. This is the other part of the company. She is awesome. I can't put both of you on screen at the same time. for uh, So if you get when someone has more screen time than the other person, I can't fix that with the current setup. But um, I want to welcome both of you. And they're going to be doing some stuff that I have not talked about previously. Uh, so we're going to do what DevOps or what is DevOps? You guys want to do, oop, Oh, and it's a fluffy kitty, mandatory <laughs> fluffy kitty. So you want to, uh, who, who wants to talk about DevOps? Give me like the 60 second summary of what, or ops, whatever the opsy stuffs are. Go What's get them, Heidi. All right. So DevOps is a term that was, uh, developed to encompass and to alleviate the dysfunction between development and operations. And that can be it operations or business operations. You want to get your features out there quickly, smoothly, securely, and not disrupt business or not make IT mad. 60 right. seconds, right? Yeah, cool. That's exactly it. And so it does. it is applicable to small business as well. So people are going to go like, Heidi, why should I care about this? And, then, and you're going to say? Well, because, you know, in a small business, yeah, one person might have several different ops roles, but you still want your features to get out there quickly and it can help you in business because uh, you might get them out there more quickly or agilely than a larger business. Cool. New features. Yeah. What I do want to point out is if you look at the upcoming training broadcast, they should be on the schedule. There they are on Thursday already. So once again, I've gone to fmtrain.tv, press the live tab, and uh, this is real data out of a real FileMaker solution. As we say here, we, woof, woof, we eat our own dog food. We eat FileMaker, we use FileMaker, we run everything on FileMaker. So over here, you can see the upcoming broadcast schedule today is self-therapy for your FileMaker server. It's pretty good. Then tomorrow and Wednesday, Nick Hunter returns with the brain transplant, FileMaker transplants, day three and day four. Then Thursday, we're going to do a couple basic installs of FileMaker server. And, uh, and so with that, uh, Jacob Taylor will be helping us with that. We're going to do a Mac one. Then a week after we do a Windows one, and then sometime after that, we're going to do the Unix one for Ubuntu. But it hasn't shipped yet, so it's not really a secret they're working on. It. They've said that publicly. But uh, that being said, it's uh, pretty interesting. So, um, and then the Moyers are here for DevOps on this day right here on Friday. This coming Friday, so that'll be pretty exciting. Um, and then along the way, then is it the next week you do something, or is it two weeks after that you're doing another webinar? It's the next Friday. Okay, so head-to-head -head comparisons. Oh, head. To, oh, that's really good. So those of you who've used other competing products to FileMaker, uh, so like Excel is not what we're talking about. We're talking about mostly it's like Airtable or one of these other G Wiz widget Betty Betty blocks or Booby blocks or whatever that is. I haven't used that one. Um, so if you have experience, you want to try or you would not try it out, but if you want to come and help express and tell us what you're impact is we're here at the FileMaker platform because it is a superior low-code product in the market at the current time. With that, I am going to pivot to Jacob Taylor. Hello, Jacob Taylor. How are you? This is Jacob Taylor. Good. Jacob Taylor is one of our server folks here at RCC. He's like the head of our server engineering kind of team. Mm -hmm. And um, today is a conversation about self-help therapy on the FileMaker server. And, and what it is, it's a couple effectively non-documented features that are very minimally documented in certain spots. Um, and, and odds are, unless you read all the readmes and all the blogs and all this stuff, you don't know about these. Vo I would say if I took 100 certified developers, 10 of them might know about this. Chris may or may not know about this. I, if I had to bet, I'd say he probably does, but 
it's it, it, there's a chance he doesn't. That's how obscure this is. So, Jacob Taylor, what are we talking about today? Sure. So the two things that we're going to cover today are um, I call them magic server side scripts. And it's because if you know how to find them in the menus, you can find them. Um, but otherwise, it's not super obvious that they exist. Um, and I'll talk about each of them, like one and then the other to kind of talk about what they do. We'll also go through like setting it up and the implications and that kind of stuff on the server. Um, so the first one that we're going to cover today is uh, Oh, I didn't put it on my screen. That's right. I'm sharing my camera. Perfect. Um, so the first one that we're going to cover today is one that uh, purges temporary database files on the server side. Um, so as you have databases open on a FileMaker server, you're hosting them for multiple user access. Uh, you have some, maybe some FileMaker Pro, Go, you know, clients connected, something like that. Um, the FileMaker server software will have some temp files that it keeps associated with kind of the databases, the users, uh, and certain other things. Like if you're running a find on the server and stuff like that, it'll keep certain parts. Um, I don't know if it finds a good example because I don't know if it keeps that particular one in a temp file on the server, but there's a few things it keeps in temp files on the server while you're doing stuff. Um, actually, a perform script on server is probably a good example of that. Um, and so what this is is a, is a script that you can schedule on the server side that blows out all of those caches. Um, this can be useful just to make sure that it happens. Um, it also is recommended by Claris for performance reasons. Um, I believe these were introduced with uh, server version 19.1 or on 19.2. I think we're waiting for 19.3. Um, that should be out shortly, theoretically, hopefully. We don't know. <laughs> be great if they told us. Um, and so, but, but generally, uh, what they would like is for us to run both of these scripts actually uh, once per day or more often, in fact. Um, and they have recommendations for when we should run them and under what circumstances and that sort of thing. So, um, the, so these are like a internal housekeeping kind of a system level script that they wrote, right? Correct. Yeah. And, and so they're 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 classified as system scripts. That's how you find them in the in the menus on FileMaker Server. But yeah, they're they're kind of like backend server maintenance. And so where within are these FNL. written up? So where is the documentation for these? Is it because the documentation for the most part for the FileMaker platform is the help? That's pretty much correct. Right. And so yeah, is it and is it talked about in the help? It, it has not made it into the help yet. Um, so it's place, not documented. Sorry. And then what about on a PDF or something on their uh, documentation web page? You want to flip to your screen and talk about that a little sure. bit? Sure. So where we are currently is we are on Claris' uh, support site. Um, and what this thing is, uh, and it's the link that was in the description. I, If you guys signed up for today, you got to – Actually, we're emailed a copy of the link technically, um, <laughs> but this is it. this is linked from Claris's engineering blog, which is they kind of shimmed it in on their support site, um, which actually has been pretty wonderful because engineering can uh, talk a little more directly to the public. I've been very happy with that, and uh, I've learned a bunch about the the software as a result. So. I do want to compliment that every time I have the opportunity. Um, but uh, in this particular case, there is a blog post that, let me give you guys the title here, uh, Performance, Stability, and Reliability Improvements. Why, yeah, why don't you back with, out one path to the to the blogs, the engineering blog. I always keep talking about this. Claris, for whatever mm -hmm. reason, the, the people done engineering, um, I think probably secretly because, you know, it seems to me this is like almost like so good that if marketing knew about it, they would have blown it up. Right, but this is a really, really, really good uh, source of information here on the FileMaker server. I mean, like really, really good. I mean, and so what they did is this documentation on this feature is buried in here. It doesn't exist anywhere else. So which one is it on here? If we're looking at the list, uh, uh, is actually this one: <laughs> performance, stability, reliability, improvements. So the improvements are there, but if you really want. So some of the so this is great. So this is let me help everyone out how, like how to interpret this. So in 19.2.1, there's some improvements in the product. But if you want to get all the improvements in the product, you have to read this blog, which almost no one does. And then you have to implement these two systems wide scripts on the FileMaker server, Mac or Windows or Linux, I'm assuming. Um, yep. And that way there's some extra maintenance that goes on. Why these so that so this is code programming that Claris created. They did not build in the product. Don't ask why they didn't build the product. Don't ask me why they didn't document it, except for this little obscure thing here. Um, I don't know. I don't. They, they don't. 
they don't talk to me. So as a result of that, um, I can't tell you, all I can tell you is that this is important. Go do it if you have a FileMaker server, um, yeah. assuming that you have a level of comfort in interacting with your FileMaker server. So, mm -hmm. um, so Jacob, yeah. if you want to go forward now, we can dive sure. in. Sure. I want to make sure people... Out, I want to call out one thing from Discord as well. Mm. So Scott Henderson says that he has this, the first one that we're going to talk about, which is purging the temporary databases on the server side. He has that one set up, but has not done the second one that I was going to talk about, which is the the the... Di oops, not that uh, the database verification, which is this one right here. Um, yeah, so there are two. So, there are two systems things that we're going to be talking about today. So, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so the reason I wanted to call that out specifically is because um, the the purge temporary database one is much safer to run whenever um, than the scheduled script uh, for verifying all your database files um, and. So I didn't really talk about that one yet, but uh, it does the ba basically what this the, the script to verify all databases, it does the canonically correct thing that you would like to be able to automate, but that was previously difficult, which is it kicks everybody off. It closes all your databases. It runs verify on all of the databases, and then it reopens them all if they are OK. Um, and that is great because uh, two things. One. Uh, if you have email notifications, for example, set up on your FileMaker server, you'll hear about it if it fails because um, it'll email you and then hopefully sit there like a dead duck uh, waiting for the human to come help it, which is great, especially if you have, you know, some messed up in your database, you can do, you know, recovery as soon as humanly possible. That's great. Um, but the second thing. And it's, it's the huge implication to it that I just said, which is it kicks everybody off and closes all the databases, which is why I say the, the other script is much safer to run. Um, you have to, you know, if you have an actual 24-7 uh, database, it may be difficult to figure out when to run something like this. Um, and they do recommend it run, be run, you know, approximately daily or so. Uh, and so... You know, if you if you really do have everybody, you know, people banging on the system twenty four seven, that can be challenging. Or, for example, like some of RCC's databases, they have the websites talking to them, and so theoretically, you know, requests can be coming in at all hours. Um, and so it would make scheduling something like that somewhat difficult. However, the upsides are huge because you can ensure that you have done a verification consistency check on your database um, and that you know that at least that check has passed on a you know daily or if you can't quite schedule it that often maybe a weekly basis so so oh, i mean so the quite david just asked the question here where is the system underscore default underscore verify all db where so i mean it's kind where because it's not yeah i mean so, ideally it would be a little radio button you just turn on here it would say on or a little radio button or checkbox that says off, right? Yep, yep. But uh, it doesn't work um, that way. <laughs> no, it does not. So, um, so I'm on the I'm on the FileMaker server admin console. Again, uh, these the the content in this video applies to FileMaker server 19.1 and newer. Um, and so uh, we're on 19.2. This is our stream server, um, and so th this will work here. But um, if you're on, for example, 18. You know, our older versions, uh, none of this stuff applies. Um, so we go in here, you go to, all right, so I went, I'm on the, I logged in, I went to the configuration tab, I went over here to script schedules, and then I'm going to create a schedule. Um, and so we're going to start out with the. By the way, this is a test question here for those of you in your certification test. So when you schedule a schedule, most people schedule a backup in here, but you can mm -hmm. schedule other stuff. And this is the other yep. stuff conversation today. So yeah, and so you could do yeah, you could do like a file maker script inside your file. Um, and this is this actually so, the system so, script so, is so the same thing. So that's sassy right there. So come back, pop that again, just so everyone yep. sees this. So this is we always hear about PSOS and sassy. This is PSOS and sassy are effectively your file maker server running a script in a file for you. Okay, that's this. This is what we call S A S E. I actually coined that term. And then Rick Kalman ran wild with it back uh, about 15 years ago. So the other option is, is what are the other options? System level script, right? That's what we want to run. Yeah. yeah. And then a script sequence of some sort. Yeah. Um, and so we're going to use system script. This would be, for example, I think if you were running, um, 
oh lord people used to run like um apple scripts and stuff on the server side or you know kick off particular processes from filemaker server on max for example um not platform specific but apple script only runs on max uh this is where you would do that basically um however today what we're going to do is we're going to pick the system script and oh there it is and so we have we have these two new options on this drop down menu for the the temp database purge and then verify all databases um you can should uh, did you have to do anything to get those show up or they should show up by default for an installation right now right is that correct yeah correct Okay. Yeah, so if I go cancel and I do a fresh one, and I just all I have to do is system script, and then you're not gonna, uh, you probably want to name it, but um, you'll do script name, and then it'll have these two in there again if you are uh, FileMaker Server 19.1 or newer. So we can do that. Um, in this particular case, we do not need to specify an account or any of that stuff, um, and we could set a timeout. I guess two minutes is probably fine. Um, click out of that, and then I'm going to do a. I have to spell correctly here. There you go. Um, and then our repeat. This is the fun part of FileMaker Server. It's figuring out how to operate this menu. So if you're going to have it, we'll do. We'll say it's going to be daily. Um, you know, I don't know whatever. Well, let's uh, let's run it at you know midnight. It's a good time. Midnight, 30, 40, 40 minutes. Sure, why not? So, so, um, so forty minutes after midnight, right? So twelve yep. forty or zero zero forty if you're yep. depending if you're in yep. twenty four o'clock. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, midnight forty. Um, and so that's it. And so then we hit save. Uh, and that's now scheduled for apparently twenty four forty, which is a great <laughs> a what great the time. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't it's mid yeah, it means midnight 40, whatever. Uh, you get some funny stuff with FileMaker Server Admin Console like that. It will run at the assigned time, uh, the, the one that you're expecting. General, General, when are the bombers going to attack the bad guys? Ah, we're going to hit them at 2440 or 2640 or 2622. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Man, I get, I, you know, back in the Army days, I'd have been yelled at endlessly. To answer, because uh, David Angel asked, when should we run? this should it be run daily or something else so these three bullet points that i have uh, highlighted here are what claris says for this so you want to run it when there's not a whole ton of people on it um for example late at night which is why my example is like you know midnight something um and you want to run it before a scheduled backup once a day so actually probably a better example would have been maybe 11 40 p.m or something like that because that'd be right before all the dailies and all that kind of stuff will run hey um, chris I, moyer are you still here Chris Moyer, can you unmute yourself? All there right, so, so so Chris said something interesting here, and Chris has been around, goes back like me, like thirty years in the FileMaker platform. So there used to be a verify in FileMaker back in the old days, right? Chris, is, is mm -hmm. this does this seem like the verify thing that that we used to have, right? I mean, so, that, I mean, the, the backup process has had the option for many versions where you could say, hey, when you make a backup, also verify the backup. Is that and, still you know, in there right now? Is it still yes. I believe that's still in there so, right so, now. So why, what is the difference? Okay, so then my question is, what's the difference between this one and the one that's attached to a backup? This one kills zombies. It kills zombies. So why don't you explain to everyone what a zombie is? So uh, it's especially uh, common with iPads that go to sleep and fall off the server, and yet they still have these sessions hanging on the server, even though the iPad lost the plot and had to log back in. So now you have, you know, iPad one, two, three connected to the server two or three times because somebody let it fall asleep. And so these um, zombie sessions, we call them, um, can be hard to get rid of. I mean, you could obviously restart the server and then they all disappear. But this is kind of the silver bullet. If you run this um, verify process at night, anything that any crust that was left hanging out in these ghost sessions will just get smoked. Okay, so and let me... So let so I am not familiar with the zombie. So Jacob T Taylor, can you go back to the uh, user, the, the the server admin interface for me, and go to the users, go to the user, so we can see who they're. The, okay, there's no users connected, but when a user connects, you see them in your Mac, Windows, all that kind of stuff. There's a 120 second timeout. So if someone is not does their client, whether it's Go Pro or whatever, doesn't communicate after 120 seconds, they are dropped from here. So you're saying that even if they are dropped from here because they time out 120 milliseconds, right? They're still like hidden in a zombie list somewhere, somewhere else. No, they're still on the list. They don't drop. Sometimes they don't drop. 
Oh, I, okay. The thing is just okay, so, so so Jacob just connected with Pro. So yep. I have not seen it where they still – okay, well, okay, that used to be a bug. Okay, back in like FileMaker 12 or something, there were bugs like where people wouldn't – you know, you'd, you'd, I remember seeing that back 10, 15, 20 years ago. You're saying that the, the zombie thing is still a thing today? Yeah, I see it a lot in environments with iOS devices where, you know, they're not mm. managing the sleep well. Mm -hmm. mm. Jacob, do you see those still? I mean, are you seeing them? Because, I mean, uh, I, I have not seen I would, it. I would – I would say yes, but I don't do the backup checks anymore. And that is when I did the backup checks. Uh, that is when I would see them. Yes. Okay. So you have so they are entries here, but they're they're not real people. They're zombies. They're they they, they they were people, and then they're either the session crashed out or okay. the thing went to sleep, and you know FileMaker server doesn't quite sure you know what happened to them. It thinks they're still connected, even yeah. though they've and remember given for up and for, for each person that's here, everyone there it, it maintains a cache of what the person is doing, what they've seen, um, mostly to make things go faster for things and more reliable, etc. So each person has their own cache. So. This process forcibly disconnects everything, and then you could also clear the cache, which is awesome. Actually, this is pretty useful. Okay, good. Well, see, I'm glad you're here, uh, Chris Moyer. <laughs> no problem. Awesome. Well, yep. yep. So uh, where else? So, so do you want to show going back through that configuration, Jacob? Or yeah. were we done with it? Was that it? Was it that? that well, was we that? we only did one of them. There's only two, so we can create the second one. So, and it's so, uh, so the purge one does that. That just purges, but it doesn't kill zombies. Correct. Does, so this other one, the verify, will kill zombies. Yes, because it uh, it forces everybody off and closes all the files, um, which yeah. Go ahead and uh, build it and run it for us. See what. Let's just watch what happens. If sure. You so I'm going to do system script. We're going to say not set. I'm going to click. Oh, there it goes. Uh, verify all so databases. David, so David Angel says, uh, so zombies equal open sessions. They are open sessions with no real computer on the other end of the session. The server thinks someone's there, but they're uh, not real. They're like ghosts or zombie or whatever you want to call it. It's a good zombie is a good term for that. So this thing kills the zombies and does a verify. So it's kind of useful from that end of things, right? So I would also verify, and then I would, uh, if it was me, I'd say zombie kill or something too, right, or whatever, right? So, yeah. Yeah, close. There we go. So if you run that, then it kills everyone and verifies. Now, how, how, is it a slow verify, like one core? Or does it use multiple cores? Do we know if it's faster, or is it kind of like slow ass? <laughs> Um, not sure. I haven't, we haven't run it on really big data sets yet. Mm -hmm. Um. As a uh, kind of a, as a general answer to that question, we've stopped doing the verify step on most of the script or most of the scheduled backups. Be actually because of that, because it takes so long. Yeah, um, yeah. Verifies you don't want to. I mean, so if you have verifies as part of your backups, verifies really slow down a backup. So you do a verify once a week or once a day at one in the morning or something. Mm -hmm. um, but if they built this as a separate process, it's possible, once again, I have to go test this, that they wrote it in such a way like they did with the data migration tool, where it takes advantage of all available cores on the all the CPU cores, et cetera. So, there it goes. Yeah, there hey. it goes. It's going to run. All right, cool. Let me close now. So this is some good – it's kind of on the deep end of the pool for those of you. You know, Timothy there from Dublin, Ohio, welcome. Uh, glad you – hey, Timothy, thank you for purchasing our training. I greatly appreciate that. This is good data. I like. This is why we bring other people over and we talk because it, this information is. All, I, I'm definitely not the smartest guy in the room. I'm just the mouthiest person in the room. So. So what did we get? So we created our things. I ran the purge DB and that went successfully, and then we get closing the so kicked me out. Close the databases. Opening with consistency check. Opening with consistency check, performing consistency check. Performing. Normally, when you see consistency check, it means it didn't close them correctly. But there, it, yeah. that's a deliberately triggered consistency check. I guess yeah, so. it closed them, opened them for a consistency check, Correct. closed them again, and then opened them again on the server. Yeah. And yep. And then we get all the way back around, and we've reopened it. Chris, did you know about this one? I guess you did, about these two uh, system level scripts. We lost Chris again. Oh. I'm back. Yeah. Yes, I did know about this. Yeah. That, that, but you can uh, see it. I was pretty keen on him as soon as I found out it was a zombie killer. I'm like, yeah, put that yeah. on. 
Yeah. So to me, that's like a nightly, you know, brush your teeth kind of activity schedule. It's like, shoot, if, if you have an environment where people fall off the network, then run that sucker every night after hours. Absolutely. So, yes, yeah, so, but you can see where it's kind of obscure, right? I mean, it's buried oh, yeah. in a blog, yeah. right? So this is one of the other notes that I wanted to bring out. I told you I did some reading this morning and to try one to try and see if there was references to these script steps elsewhere, like other than the engineering blog. And I couldn't find any. Um, the other thing that I pulled out that was really uh interesting that i i suppose is just like a buried detail was basically that line right there so um it's a non-obvious uh system requirement you need there to be 10 to 20 percent of your total fmp12 size to be available for cache purposes on the server side um and that's why they say, you know, you need some amount of disk space or something like that for the FileMaker server software. Um, but having it be, not be, oh, you know, you need 20 gigs free or something like that, but actually relative to your data set size um, is yeah, interesting. We've run into this uh, with actually some really smart people lately. And I had to, I felt like slapping them around. Um, some people in the FileMaker community, they were like, yeah, our database is 300 um, gigs. I'm like, eh. Okay, that's a fat database. That's a huge database, <laughs> right? And a lot of it was containers, but still, it's pretty fat. And then, remember, we had this conversation without incriminating the person who I'm not going to embarrass. He probably watched the broadcast. But then there's that, like, our drive size is like 600 gigs or 1,000 gigs or something. Like, so, and what they did, they filled up their hard drive. The hard drive got filled up, filled up because proportionally, just one copy of their database was a third of the drive. And then as cash, remember, it is 10 to 20 percent, but it depends upon the number of users. If you have 50 or 100 users on there, that it's gonna, it's gonna, you could easily use. Well, they had used all the space up, and so in addition to zombie users, there's also zombie caches, right? So I guess, I guess I could coin that term. So because that's what the broadcast that we're talking about today is clearing these caches. Clearly, FileMaker server should clear them on its own. It should do it without. Uh, you know, inter interaction or intervention from us, but it, it clearly there are dead caches. It should go away, um, and it doesn't know how to manage them. And and even on FileMaker Pro, we talked about it last week. How to clear clear your cache on your copy of FileMaker Pro, right? We did it on the Mac. There's Windows, very similar Windows uh, process. So this is kind of that automatic for the server because who wants to log into their server every day and clear the cache, right? So you have zombie caches, zombie users, and these scripts help manage that stuff. Yep, Heidi. Yeah. Heidi, you could unmute yourself and just like verbally give this to us. You're part. Of, I mean, you managed to like come into the conversation today. Hello, Heidi. No, right. Yeah, that was that's a good note from her. They were like, turn off startup restoration if you're having performance issues. No, I was just noting that it still mentioned startup restoration when that's FM19 and that's turned off by default. Yeah. So you can't. Yeah. That's not. Even you take that out of the help. Yeah. 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 So how, so. So how much uh, free space? Okay, there's a question from David. Good topic. How much free space should the server have? Um, Plenty. I never, never less than. Um, I can give you two sides of it. So you need the 20% of the database size for the cache stuff. Uh, you also need. Uh, so you never, you never ever want to be less than 10% free on any drive under any circumstance. Frankly, um, there's. That's a really bright line rule I can give you that solves a lot of problems for you, um, basically. <laughs> uh, I can, there's about seven different issues that if you if you make sure you always have more than 10%, you, yeah, you won't, you won't have issues. All right, all right. Um, Just stop for a second. Just stop. I'm going to help everyone else here. I'm going to move my camera down here, right? I'm going to move my camera down here. I'm going to put my hand down here. Right? Get my camera down here with my hand. Have you seen those little, like, games where people are drinking and some of the alien movies and stuff, and they flip out a knife, and they're, like, going – Right, really fast between their fingers with a knife, right? Chop, 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 chop. If you are doing something exceptionally stupid, like you've got a 50 gigabyte database and an 80 gigabyte hard drive, you're doing this with your knife, with your finger, back and forth as fast as possible without trying to cut your finger off. Who wants to do that, right? What what planet are you from? Please spend the money and get a bigger hard drive. I, I, Jacob should never have to say, never be less than 10%. That's just running around with a knife trying to stick yourself or your customer. Stop. It's a public safety commercial. Please don't play with knives. And if you do, don't do it with your FileMaker server. No, he, he's, he's right, though, to talk about the uh, basically the organizational issues that can cause that situation. Because often IT 
uh, is put under the CFO. And so the company considers them to be a cost center rather than an operational uh you know, benefit yep. or, and or, then you, and you do some weaselly cheesy stuff like, Oh, well we could save $5 with the, with the hard drive space every day. If we say $5 a day and then over 30 days, it's a hundred dollars for the month. And I'm like, okay. And the, and the meeting to make that decision costs more than you'd save. <laughs> yeah. Unless, unless your consultants are all like $5 an hour, Chris Moyer, he's, you can get him a special, a 10 hour block if for $6 and 50 cents an hour. Right. So, yep. <laughs> Yeah, Heidi's like, yeah, no doubt, right? So, well, Heidi, so this is the fun that we have. We got sharp knives, sticks, FileMaker servers, all the good stuff you need for for a uh, broadcast. So, um, other questions about FileMaker servers, and we have some, like, literally three of the smartest people I know uh, in the broadcast. I'm just simply playing with sharp objects here. Any questions here, folks? Yeah, it's running. That's this is something that we do on all of our FileMaker servers. We have them. Um, there's a the at least on Windows, it's really easy. There's a built-in. Um, it's called Clean Manager. It's the little utility where you can like clean up like I don't know old Windows updates caches and maybe like IE temp folders and whatever weird weird old stuff that you might not think about. Um, that'd be kind of trashing up your hard drive. That's not um, like that clean thing. I keep getting ads for the Mac trashy program that puts virus no. stuff on the mac it's like clean no this is this thing it's this cleanup this is this is how most people would know it for windows it looks like that when you launch it and you pick your drive and you hit okay um let me do that real quick it should calculate it pretty quickly because um, we just ran it <laughs> uh but so what this thing does is it's the it's what it it on windows is what can for example safely clean up windows update and windows defender old trash and and whatever just various like caches all over the place including the windows cache directory itself um one of the small but big changes we made on our um, amazon servers is we always put a schedule for this thing on the on the servers um, that runs basically every week um, as a result of that, I stopped getting customers calling us saying that their uh, FileMaker server had fallen, their FileMaker server on Amazon had fallen over um, because the Windows drive, the, like the boot drive had filled. Um, there's still some kind of issue in FileMaker server, I think, um, with not cleaning up uh, container data cache or intermediary files or something, you know, perfectly every time or something like, you know, a little bit of extra uh, builds up or something like that. And so for businesses that do lots of, lots of container data, if they're doing document storage and stuff like that, or generating lots of PDFs on the server side or, you know, just things of that nature. Um, once we put this kind of pre-programmed schedule in there, uh, I've not had those calls anymore from clients. And so, um, just because it goes through and um, if FileMaker server is like not looking at a file anymore and it hasn't locked it because it like forgot about it and that's why the file's there because it's supposed to have cleaned up after it and it didn't or something, um, Windows will come in and go, oh, cool, like that's a temp directory file that nobody's paying attention to right now and clear it all out. Um, and so you don't you don't hear about it anymore. Um, it just gets cleaned up automatically. And that that's one little small fail safe that'll keep your server from falling over. Because if anyone who's worked on Windows servers knows, Windows really, really, really hates it when you fill the, fill the boot drive. Really hates it. All right, so, so I'm showing the uh, Discord uh, conversation going on here, and Kyle had a really good one conversation here. He goes, I found that if the IT uh, person, I say guy, but IT person tries to troubleshoot FileMaker server, they usually open up the services. They force shut the service down, crashing the files. Blah 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 yep. blah blah. It's all bad. No, nope, it's bad juju, right? So. Yep. I, so, yeah, I, I spent a not inconsequential amount of my time trying to make sure IT guys don't do literally that. Yeah. And then we've actually had them where we uh, we're talking to the CEO. We've we explained to them how to do it properly. The CEO's watching it. The CEO trusts us by far. And then this then their uh, IT guy figures that no one's watching him, and so he crashes the files anyway. And that says, screw it, I'll do what I want, which <laughs> yes. results in another CEO conversation, right? <laughs> Seriously. Second CEO conversation. Second yes. CEO conversation, actually, yeah. So, that was not, uh, that was suboptimal, we'll say. <laughs> suboptimal. There, there we go. That's an understatement. So how do you block that only the FMS services? With you don't. You can't. Because the IT guys are always going to have admin access, and they're the, the default knob that you turn on every other 
server <laughs> software whatever that's on windows is you're going to go into the services menu and try and kill it um and i gotta write that down the default no that's one of those quotes i gotta write down hang on i gotta write that down when you guys have like super excessively witty things the default knob the turn okay yep. default knob to turn that's good stuff but See? so cuz th cuz they're always going to be your administrator of some sort or another and for every other uh windows service that is it's you know it's correctly integrated with windows um yeah actually going into the services menu and hitting stop is the correct thing um, and most software will interpret that correctly shut down safely etc um we actually basically at this point still don't trust filemaker server to always do that perfect every time um and and one of the one of the I, I mean i can basically explain what goes wrong if you have clients on the server currently uh actually that's a bad example i can give an even better example um the dumbest one possible so if you have a backup schedule currently running on the server, for example, there is nothing you can do that can shut the server software down. It won't do it until the backup is completed. In fact, it won't do anything until the backup is completed, um, which I love. It's great. Uh, the backup should run and complete successfully. However, if you try and stop it while it's doing that, um, Windows has an internal timeout uh, for how long you know you ask a process to stop and it does so uh, it has a kind of a tolerance level for how long that can take um, and it's long enough for most things uh, but if the backup is taking a while it's not going to be long enough and so windows will either eventually uh, give up and stop um, and then either the user will force it or there's a couple situations under where windows will get pissed off at it and shoot the process um, and you want neither of those situations to happen um, and so it's one of the reasons why we're like always, always, always go into the admin console and close everything down first, because that's actually where you'll see, oh, I try and close my files and they're sit they're sitting there in the closing status. And that doesn't quite make sense. And it's because you've got a backup running and that close requ you've, you've requested FileMaker server close the files. That won't happen until the backup is completed. Same thing. Yeah. So. And so Peter Gein just said that, yeah, I answered from the IT guy today. If I shut down the process, then... You know, if FileMaker server doesn't gracefully shut itself down, then it sucks, right? So, yes, right? Yep. So. Correct. Yeah, and and that's just because FileMaker server doesn't integrate amazingly with Windows. Um, it doesn't integrate amazingly with Mac either. It's kind of its own thing, um, and that's that's fine. It's just there's a little bit of extra you got to think about. And uh, but the thing is, is like you can learn all of this stuff and like get all into the details and get all up to your elbows in this stuff, or just follow the process, which is go to the admin console close the databases and then it doesn't matter what you do on the you know with the services menu or something like that um one of the reasons i actually specifically tell people to go and close the databases like do that your, yourself by hand is because if that succeeds what happens after doesn't matter at all um i'll often run into like a for example like a filemaker server 16 or something that's been running for literally several years straight um you know no problems basically from the user from the client's perspective there's been no issue um and so every time i go and touch any of the servers of that vintage uh i close the files first that's the first thing i do i go into the admin console and i close the files because often when you go and shut the server software down when it's been running that long it's like buggy in ram or whatever and fms just crashes just falls over well if you close the databases before that happened, we don't care if it crashes at all. That doesn't matter even a little bit because your databases are safe. You don't have to care. Um, and you're, you know, if it's a 16 server and it's been literally running for several years straight, you're probably about to do a reboot anyway. So that'll, that'll clean up any of the other parts of that mess that you might be concerned about. Cool. So, David, uh, over here, so you can see the once again, the ongoing conversation over here. How do you close a database from a command line? There's your command line command right there. Okay. So there you go. And that'll ask you for the admin console username and password um, unless you've turned on a very particular setting on the admin console, um, which I can show if you want. But uh, let's go here. It looks like we logged or it got us logged out. So you go into administration. Um, this is a similar setting. Obviously, it will look different on the old versions of FileMaker Server. Um, no. What am I looking for? I'm sorry, it's an external authentication. So um, again, this looks super different on old versions, but uh, I think even 14 forward can do this. Uh, you basically ch do this thing and then it's a user group name. So in Windows parlance, that's gonna be administrators, I think. Um, 
Let's see if that works. Yes. Um, and then Mac, I think it's admins, A D M I N S. Um, and so then you can you can turn that on and you can turn this thing on. And then now we have allowed uh, users in this user group, which this is a single server with no, it's not in a, a domain, a Windows domain context or something like that. So, you know, you could say administrators or, or maybe put in your full network administrators list and then any of those people could just automatically log in. Um, and then you come down here and turn this on. And then basically at this point, once those two things have been done, uh, you can like run command line utilities um, like FMS admin um, and they will just run basically it won't ask you for the username and password so okay so real quick uh moyer port uh, uh the, i always call it port moyer because it's a uh, heidi porter and uh, chris moyer uh you folks if you can unmute yourselves do you have any other comments or questions along the lines of funky servery stuff that you'd want to throw in since you're probably still here i'm assuming you're here. not off the top of my head i don't know if heidi's got anything not off the top of my head head okay well that's the i'm thinking point. about the the whole um you know it people not understanding and uh how you help them yes well you have to kind of do it in a nice way um but at the same time it depends on what their motivations are if you have a if you have a i mean I, that's a whole conversation right there in of itself but is if your it organization that you're dealing with has a specific political agenda like a we're all oracle or a we're all sap or salesforce or all microsoft then they're going to be anti everything else so they may not want to get along if you have a legit like neutral like hey we're here to be helpful kind of it organization I, I, I guess if there's not d deliberately political, then they might want to be helpful, but they might be a little bit too lazy to like follow the steps. So I, you, I mean, you guys deal with that a lot, right? You know, at, at, at the Moyer group, right? So, I mean, any. It, it really, you know, everybody's different, right? The, yeah. the outsourced yeah. IT, um, you know, if we help them, they're happy, right? The in-house IT um, can be different. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I think that's the biggest difference is in-house IT tends to have more political clout. And if they are opposed to FileMaker, then they're a lot harder to deal with. But outsource IT, if they're opposed to FileMaker and someone inside wants FileMaker, then they just sort of have to deal with it. And so I think the dynamic is different there in terms of you know getting uh, buy-in on the IT side. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they're just hired guns, right? The, out yeah. the outsource IT. Yep. Yeah. Okay. The, the, out, the outsourced people, I've had much better luck with them just going, oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, can I get 30 minutes of your time to sit down and run through the run through this stuff really fast so we don't screw this up for our customer, basically. Okay. Um, okay so, Jacob, just a second ago, you answered the question for Raccoon Ops is what that one was from uh, Twitch, right? The question about admin remotely on server 19. Is there a place enabled? Yeah, remote admin, right? That was a question um, you were answering. Enable remote admin. This what is? is uh, I actually don't know what that question is. Can I ask a question about? Because your... there's three. Yeah, yeah. Because I can think of three different meanings for remote admin, and their question does not enable. Well, remote why don't admin you explain to us the three ways of administering the server? Okay, so the the three that I can think of. So there's one thing which is I'm looking at the admin console right here. Literally, this you know thing that's in my web browser. This web interface, um, yeah. Yeah. So if and if you're trying to get to that from somewhere not on the server, somewhere else, um, you're going to have to have port. I know it's sixteen thousand and one. That's the local port. Uh, it's one sixteen thousand, one sixteen thousand one. So yes. So if you're remote, you're going to go to port sixteen thousand. It's going to do that. Um, so that's one thing. If you have the username and password for the admin console. You don't have to change anything at this point. If this port's available to you and you have the credentials, you can get in. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing that I was thinking of that is a remote admin is the admin API, um, which I yep. forget who it is that makes that, but there's, there is a FileMaker database that will let you interface with that easily. And Klaus, also- Yeah, Klaus Levent Klaus makes Levent. that with the brain basket. He has a little tool that helps you administer that. So there's three ways of administering FileMaker server. This is one, then you have a command line right on the machine. Yep. And that's the second way. And the third way is what we call the server admin API. 
And so it's kind of this uh, API process. And it's funny, some of the some of the features of FileMaker 19, you can get to them in here, or you can get to them in the command line, you can get to them in the data API, or the uh, server API. But frequently, a feature is only available in one of them, or in two of them. And so to fully administer a FileMaker server, you almost have to have access to all three just about, right? Um, for example, if you're in the web interface and you want to fix the RAM cache, a lot of people never change the RAM cache and they can't figure why it's so horribly slow. And the default is a really small number like 128 megs or 500 megs or yeah, something. Yeah, 512. 512. And so really you, low. But you can't fix that in here. You have to do that either in the data API or the command line. So here he is in the command line doing it through the command. Let me try this. Ooh, it's not. Hold on. See. Oh, come on. There it goes. Okay. Sorry, the first one, it asked me for my, my username and password, and then I canceled it and ran the command again because now it is just letting me do it um, because it it went and checked and found oh, this they, thing. That you've, turn, you've, turned, you've turned that on. Okay, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't check it, like, at the front. Um, the point of this here is, because I wanted to show the cache size, ours is set to 7.5 gigs, but the default there is 512 megabytes. Yeah. So. so so this is a 16-gig server, so we've allocated you know, a little bit less than half to the... Uh, to the uh, ah, okay, so for, for Raccoon Ops, uh, let's see, URL by local IP address doesn't work. Um, again, make sure that you, when you're accessing it remotely, which is not you know, localhost, that you're using port 16,000, um, not 16,001. Uh, the the and one only works locally. The 16,000 only works off the machine, I think. Maybe it works locally, too. I haven't checked. I should probably check. <laughs> Let me check. Let's do that. Let me do localhost. Let's try it. 16,000, if that works. Mm, yeah, it seems kind oh, of... Oh, doesn't long. work locally. Nice. Okay, cool. Yeah, so that's clear. I like that. All right, cool. Yeah, so... Just wanted to make sure I wasn't lying on accident. Um, yeah, so 16,000 only works off the machine. 16,001 only works on the machine. No and it says, why, what, why would databases not show on the console using Firefox? Because Firefox is not a supported browser? That is the correct answer. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's for, not so for that doesn't Andrew, actually explain it, but yeah, <laughs> it doesn't explain it, but it also means that Claris won't listen to you if you complain. So yeah, so the the approved browsers are basically more or less the current releasing shipping versions of Safari, of the uh, Edge browser, whatever that is, um, and then of course uh, Chrome, right? Yep. So that's what yeah, you Chrome. need. You need to use one of those three. If you're a Firefox person and you just hate the corporate America and you only want your own kind of whatever. Um, yeah, I don't want to tell you, right? People, I get these things like, hey, the, Parker, the blah, 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 blah on WebDirect doesn't work. And I go, what browser? Firefox. They go, you know that's not supported. Yeah, but it mostly works, but then this one thing doesn't. So who do I complain to? And I'm like, no one. Nobody. Nobody. They don't care. Yeah. So If they were going to support Firefox, they would. But that's not, the thing is, is they're looking at, they're not looking at like browser support, which people will be like, oh, but they have 15% of the, you know, whatever. Um, and that's great, but there's like 0% in enterprise. Um, and so like no no one does that um, or almost no one does that. In the enterprise, okay. Yeah. Okay. It's cool. not, most people do Chrome. Um, and actually the reason for that is because uh, Google puts out administrative templates for group policy stuff. Um, that have like every single little twiddly knob and button uh, that you can configure at the admin level, you know, as your 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 domain administrator or something in Windows, um, and all the IT people just love that stuff, and so they're like, cool, yeah, everybody gets it done um, because they can force things on or off or force uh, browser add-ons on you and uh, all that kind of stuff. So, cool from a Raccoon Ops. Okay, now. <laughs> Now it says SSL certificate for the login doesn't work with the default Claris test certificate. Is this true? And then Jacob. Sure. <laughs> um, so certain browsers will reject the Claris test certificate. That's true. Um, you either need to learn how to override your browser or install an actual SSL certificate. Uh, if the machine is on the internet, 
like accessible off of your own, say, office network or wherever the server is, I would basically consider that SSL certificate to be a requirement. Um, I we don't always tell people to do it if the server's only in their LAN or some, you know, in your in your office and it's not accessible externally, because you know, in some ways, it doesn't particularly matter because you're not on the internet. However, uh, IT best practices actually are that you should also have an SSL certificate in that scenario, even if it's not on the internet at all. Um, and that's basically under the under the premise that you're considering your local network to be an attacker on you potentially, um, which if you are a company that does interesting things, uh, you may know what that means. Um, I'll just say that <laughs> generically. Uh, then you will know that your local network is a threat to your <laughs> operational ability. So that was good. That was good. I'm sure uh, Chris has some stories about the uh, projects where he went in. I think the, he told me about a project one time they were working on uh, the coding material on the F-22 Stealth uh, the Raptor, and that material is super classified, and they were yes. storing that information in a FileMaker database, I'm pretty sure. So, yeah, so anyway. Uh, yeah, and, and if you're working on the coding for the F-22 mm -hmm. uh, and you don't have absolutely every security option exercised to the max, uh, you got problems. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. your problems have problems. <laughs> your problems have problems, and then you're going to be like that uh, pipeline company the other day. So, um, people got Ooh, all mad that's at a me. Good one. Good note from Chris. Oh, I didn't know that. Wait, Chris, you know, SSL certificate, that, ODC. Yeah, I mean, basically, a whole bunch of stuff doesn't work very well if you don't have yeah. the SSL subscription. Dappy yep. doesn't work. Well. And I'll and I'll give you a tiny one also. Uh, this is it's like a it's like some little note. Uh, when you install your SSL certificate, like when you you know if you go and you put the little pieces in and hit go um when you do that always reboot filemaker and preferably the entire system afterwards um it will different versions will do different misbehaviors but it often misbehaves in that scenario even though everything looks fine you know even though whatever it'll say oh yeah you know just restart the filemaker server service um you know go into that in windows or do the same thing in mac um it it doesn't on the windows at least it doesn't always actually perfectly get everything done and so i just that's the last thing that we do is we do a reboot afterwards cool so all right everyone well that's about it for today we appreciate all the hard work by everyone uh on what goes on and uh in the filemaker server and obscure things and then and heidi and chris actually showed up and actually made huge contributions to the conversation isn't that great jacob taylor don't we like it when they do that yes I'm excited for them to be here Friday. Yeah, I know. Friday, they can talk about how they uh, they whip an IT into shape with, with a whip. <laughs> that wasn't even one of our topics, but I guess we'll make it one. <laughs> well, you could you could do DevOps, but then how pe how to make people follow your 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 plan, right? So you can have an ops, but if everyone ignores it, right? Oh, oh, right. So, all right, cool. That's it for today. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. We'll catch you tomorrow. See ya. Great job up front, protecting this quarterback to give you a chance. And that's all you can ask for. Trying to rally down 10. 925 to go here in the fourth. Short motion by Amendola from the left. Brady takes the shot to the step. Stands in, throws it left for Amendola. Reaches up and snaps a high throw and lands inside the 10. Rolling to the 9. Ball slightly behind him, but Danny makes the grab.